growing up under that dark cloud of the consciousness of racism, something I just didn't, I didn't experience that. You know, in high school, I, I passed off as just, you know, he's an Italian, he's a white boy, he's whatever it is. They didn't <laughs> care. They didn't even know what an Arab was, right. you know? I mean, what does that do to you, you know, psychologically? So for me, CD, I can only speak from personal experience. Um, I, I definitely would not contend to speak for all uh, black America, especially since I have a, a mother who's, who's German, blonde hair and, and blue eyes. Um, when I was younger, I was acutely aware of race because I was the only black child in an entire white family. So I have, uh, I have siblings, I have uh, an older sister, a younger brother and a younger sister, but all from different fathers. Mm -hmm. So we share the same mother, but we have different fathers. And my father was the only one who was black American. So I grew up in kind of, uh, in the 70s, you know, born in the early 70s, grew up in a time and space where uh, it was very clear to me that I was different. You know, I had a big afro, it was much darker uh, as a child then, and there's no way I could have not been seen as a, as a black child. So I, uh, I was acutely aware of race and how people perceive uh, black Americans uh, from a very, very young age, from a very young age. I mean, so you, you, let's let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, uh, you know, we're we're only sixty years or so off from, you know, the the civil rights movement. It, it feels sometimes for some people that it's very far away, but in reality, it's just it was just around the corner. Just changed names. <laughs> I mean, it's it's not it's never ended. You know, it just it became uh, something that had to happen. I think more behind closed doors. Uh, than, than out in front as it was before the civil rights movement where, you know, people were, black Americans were being lynched um, in mid-daylight. You know, if we look at the, at the real history of it, there are postcards that you can find today with white Americans posing with hanging black bodies from, from trees uh, signed by them and their kids as Christmas cards sent out to, to people. You could do the research, it, it's there. So this was something that was taking place, you know, in the, in the 20s, the 30s, in the 40s, you know, before the civil rights movement. The, what we're realizing now, what we're witnessing to, today in, in 2020, is that the sentiment that caused that, the right. ideas that, that caused that, haven't gone away. They were maybe just pushed uh, behind closed doors for a bit. It's just going through my mind and heart like, oh my God, how hurtful is it? that blood, sweat, and tears, and we know the history of the black community of America, you know, uh, with the slave trade and everything, like, and still to this day, yeah. I can't breathe. Yeah, yeah that, that I can't breathe is a, is a slogan. My fear is it's, it's gonna become a, it's gonna become a hashtag that will, that will easily die out with a, with a new trend that comes, and this will be kind of a, a forgotten thing. But in reality, I can't breathe is been, has been the cry of black America for over 400, over 400 years, suffocated at every step of the way, um, socioeconomically, politically, economically, you know, growing up in poor neighborhoods, being educated by people who also grew up in those poor neighborhoods, don't have a chance to get out of those poor neighborhoods. And it's this perpetual you know, cycle that, that, that we're caught up in. And then people looking from the outside in, if we're honest, people from our community as well, from the outside in saying, why don't they help themselves? Why don't they just, you know, slavery is over. Like, why don't, you, why don't you get over it, you know? And this isn't, you know, now, now because of, 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 of the movements that are, that are taking place now, there's not much of a need to educate America or even immigrants, immigrants in America about the black plight. Yeah, and you know, the, the Arab community, which I'm part of, the Daisy community, which I adopted myself into that, <laughs> that I love so much, you know, we have it there. We have these issues there. We have these ailments there. We, we all know it. We, we, we have to admit it. I'm not even really worried about people at this point recognizing their inherent racism. That's something between them and their Lord. That's something that they got to figure out. That's something that communities that have this within the community have to figure out on their own. That's not something that I can, that I can do. My concern right now is really as a, as a start for you at least to see that black America is completely disenfranchised and it's systemic. It's not because they're prone to criminality. Don't talk about black on black crime. You know, look at the reality of how the trajectory of what it means to be black American in the United States from inception has gotten to where it's gotten right now. And no, it does not matter that you have darker skin 
you might you might be from Bangladesh, you might be from India, from Pakistan, from Syria, from Palestine, any place, and you might have dark skin and think that that gives you the right to usurp the black narrative or to say, I've been discriminated against too. And I'll tell you why, and this isn't gonna be popular with people, it's based on one thing. Where do you come from? Who's your tribe? Where's your lineage go back to, right? If it doesn't go back to enslaved Africans that came over on slave ships to the United States of America that had their entire history, their religion, their names, their, their, their relationships with their family ripped apart from children. If your history doesn't have that in it, don't say it's the same, it's not the same. I'm sorry, it's not the same. And so that's what I'm saying right now. It's not the time for people who don't have slavery in their history to stand up and dictate what it is people should or shouldn't be doing and to criticize people who have been systemically oppressed for 400 years for standing up and saying no more. I don't know what I can say other than that, Mustafa. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. <laughs> I don't know what to say either. I know, and, I, and, I, and we want to be able to be in a place in America where if, if, there's a, if there's a burglary in our home, we're not scared to call the cops because we're going to be the ones that get shot. We want America to be what it is they said it was. And for everyone that's in America and everyone who claims to be our brothers, to be our sisters, to make our situation and the welfare and the, and, and the well-being of black Americans the same way we do with any other cause. I don't know what else to say. So, you know, Mustafa, you know, everyone thinks that, as I mentioned before, you, you read an article, uh, you, you write a ha put a hashtag, and all of a sudden you're no longer a racist. Uh, but that's not the reality. I mean, there, there were Sahabis, companions of the Messenger of God, peace be upon him, who still had racism within them. Uh, Sayyidina Bilal was called, you know, uh, the, the, the son of a black woman. And he took that, that Sahabi to the Prophet, and the Prophet said, did you say that about him? You have, you have arrogance inside you. You have, you have ignorance inside you. And so I think, you know, and unless the community is willing to deal with it as a spiritual disease, because that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we've accepted sort of these, uh, these bumper stickers of what Islam is. Islam is not racist. Islam is fair. Islam is equal. But then I'm a racist. I'm not fair. I'm not giving people equals rights because I haven't gone through a spiritual purification process to get all that stuff out of me. And unless I'm willing to do that and just start to admit, like, yeah, I consciously or subconsciously have elements of racism in me, oh, God, help me get this out. And then starting to engage the community that I'm racist towards to be a khadim, be a servant. You know what Imam Ghazali would say? If you have arrogance towards one person, go be their servant. Take out their trash. Put yourself under their feet. Go do whatever they need to do. Go put yourself in a position of humility towards that community or that individual that you have these feelings inside you towards so that God showers you with his mercy and gets those feelings outside your heart. Because if you don't do that, you're going to be accountable on the day of judgment. And if God takes you account for your spiritual diseases that you didn't purify, they're going to have to get purified there. And racism is a subcategory of arrogance at the end of the day. And the prophet, peace be upon him, he told us that no one enters paradise if they even have an atom's weight of arrogance in their heart. So racism can actually lead you to hellfire. <laughs> I think that's the way to look at it, too, if you want, you want continued change, right. right? Because if it just becomes, you know, oh, I'm aware now, I'm, a, I'm, I'm awake or woke, whatever it is, the, whatever it is the new vernacular is, I'm going to support this cause, but then I'm going to go home to my particular community, whatever community that is, and I still have intrinsic bias against members of my own community, then that movement that you supported didn't, didn't help you. But that's not long term. That's not going to help you, like you said, when you're, when you're at the gates or when you're ready to receive your book in your right or your left, your left hand. That's not going to help you there. So we have to fight it at the core of it, right? And at the core of it, it's like you said, it's, it's, it's arrogance. What is it about me that makes me think I'm somehow better than this person based on a trait that I don't control, right? right? Uh, based on, a, on a, a, a color of skin, right? Or a class that I was born into or a socioeconomic class that I was born into that I don't control. I'm going to be arrogant against this other person. It has to happen at the level of Tezkiah. But that's, that's probably harder 
than just hashtagging your way through a movement because now I have to do the real work. I have to, I have to fight the cause and, and, and not the symptoms. And sometimes that's, that's a lot harder. It's a lot harder because I have to look inside. Like, and, and I have to admit that I have something that I have to, like what, what is it that causes you to go to the doctor? Sure, we're gonna go periodically for, for a checkup, but we go to the doctor, we go to the emergency room, we have an ailment that we can't deal with anymore, that we can't figure out anymore. And so we have to go to the spiritual doctors to fix this, right? And those are the ulama, those are the scholars, those are the men and women who have been connected to men and women that go all the way back in an unbroken chain to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of people who have taken on this work of rectifying and purifying themselves. Real work is to get rid of the thoughts and the ideas and the stuff that's embedded in our hearts that make us look down on another people. That's more important than that. I'm not saying protesting is that you shouldn't do it. I'm not saying that you shouldn't hashtag, but there has to be more behind it, especially for us as a Muslim community. Mustafa, you know, I, I know this is a hard conversation. I thank you for it. It's a heavy, con I, I mean, even here, and I'm listening to you, it's heavy for me. Mustafa, thank you for your time. Barakallah feekum,